Okay, hello, it's uh, Paul Green from the business community. We're doing another one of our regular uh, spotlight on interviews where we get to sort of like probe a business owner and find a little bit about what makes them uh, tick. So today we're probing Tim. Good morning, Tim. Morning, Paul. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to ask you sort of like a set of questions just to find out a little bit more about you and, um, you know, your business journey. And I think later you're going to share some of your uh, top tips for us. So just to start off with, you just want to introduce yourself and let people know who you are and what you do. Certainly, yeah. Um, well, Tim Mullock, as it says on the, on the uh, list there. Um, I run a small business called Adept Asset Solutions based in Oni. Um, I've been in financial services since 1986. Um, started off as a, a trainee broker, qualified um, pretty quickly in 87. Um, then moved to various IFA practices and then ended up in private banking, dealing with... Um, high net worth, generally quite well off individuals on their sort of private client side of things, um, particularly around where uh, they may sell a business and are looking to um, retire and then the sort of knock on of that uh, for their generations to come. So that's my sort of very brief history. Um, obviously the banking crisis came along which meant that to look for alternatives. So I looked around and, and set up all we have today is Adept Asset Solutions. Uh, I work closely with uh, a trust corporation company called Countrywide, who are based in Kenilworth. Um, they're the leading um, asset protection specialists in the UK, um, dealing with wills, trusts, lasting power of attorney, and quite complex uh, financial planning um, to do with um, um, well, estates, really. Um, obviously, it's a, um, some of that can happen to everybody, sadly. Um, is what happens when you die, where does that money go, and making sure it goes to the right people in the right right form. Okay, so um, what was the catalyst then that had you, I guess, come out of the corporate finance world and set up uh, Adept Asset Solutions as, as your own business? Uh, yeah, it was all sorts of things, really. The main thing was that, um, I, fortunately for me, my, my wife, Nikki, has got a very good contract work in London. And we had a young son at the time, Jack, um, and I stepped aside and sort of became a house husband. Um, and um, obviously, as he grew up, he needed me less. Um, and so I was looking around what I could do. And I sort of looked backwards at what I'd done historically. I didn't want to be an IFA again. Um, that just didn't really uh, um, sort of float my boat as such. But I did enjoy dealing with people's financial affairs. Mm -hmm. So I said, um, um, looked around and thought, oh, estate planning, that's something that I know a lot about of, um, with a lot of experience, um, but um, I'm not really sure how to set it up. And that's where I came uh, across Clive Ponder and um, Countrywide, and they gave me the, uh, the tools necessary to do what I do today. Okay, and when, when was that? When did you start the business? Good question, because it's my uh, seven years ago. So I started off self-employed, been incorporated six years ago, and this week apparently it's my work anniversary. I had lots of thank yous on, uh, or congratulations rather, on LinkedIn. That sends uh, send that message up. So yeah, six years we've been running as Adept Asset Solutions. Excellent. Okay. And and in in the sort of people that you're working with or business you're working with, are there any? Is there any particular target audience or any particular people that you tend to be working with most? Um, yeah, it depends on the sort of introducers I, I connect with, so IFAs, accountants, and so on. I suppose my ideal clients, if that's if that's the way to phrase it, is a business owner um, mm -hmm. who has been um, uh, married before, got uh, what we call a blended family, i.e. children from one relationship, and maybe his spouse or partner has their own children, um, and they may even have children together themselves, So, which really does complicate things if you've got, say, He's got two children and, and, and the partner's got two children and they want their own. Um, how are you going to divide those assets up between, um, you know, sadly when people pass on? So, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, business owners they, uh, uh, have a, 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 a more complex scenario because of the reliefs available to them in inheritance tax, which makes life quite, uh, quite interesting from my side. Of it. Yeah. And, and I think it's still a majority of people in the UK that don't have a will. 
Um, what, yeah. what, why, why do you think that is? What, what do you think stops people doing it, particularly if they're in, I think, what you call it, like a blended family where, you know, there are complications and it's not necessarily straightforward if you do uh, pass away where your assets are going to go to. So what, what do you think is the, is, is the barrier for people getting something appropriate in place? I think it's a mixture of things, really. A lot of it is emotion, um, in that they, they don't want to face the reality that we are mortal. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it is also manana. We'll, we'll do that tomorrow. You know, not planning to die today. We'll do that much, much later on in life. Um, and and also, I suppose it's not actually talking about it with your mm -hmm. partner. So um, a lot of assumptions are made um, about what's going to happen, um, particularly around. Uh, those who don't have a will, they're not aware maybe of the laws of intestacy. There is a, a quite a strict format that dictates how much or how little, uh, in some cases, some people can inherit. Um, but I think that the, the, the one that really does stand out the most, and is, which is uh, interesting, is, is actually who to appoint as guardian. Mm -hmm. So you've got a, 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 a you know, little um, tribe of little ones, uh, children, and you're not 100% sure who you want to trust to look after them um should the worst happen and both um of the uh people in a relationship die um and again people aren't aware that you can blend things in that side as well you can have guardians for financial side of things and you have guardians for their well-being as well so um and it can be age related as well so it could be my older children so it could be up until certain so's to your age a lot of flexibility that can be added into that arrangement and I think it comes back down to people just aren't aware that you can do these things and mm. tailor to your own personal circumstances. Yeah. And then I guess that leads on to sort of like for businesses like lasting power of attorney. So, you know, depending on the company structure uh, and how it's set up, if, if one person dies, you know, then all of a sudden you don't get access to the bank accounts and, and stuff like that. Uh, and, and again, I don't I don't. I, I don't know the stats for, you know, how many business owners actually have that in place, but I guess it's the similar sort of apathy to that as regards wills as well, is it, in your experience? Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a mix there. You've got lasting power of attorney for business owners. There could be, um, you know, uh, John and Jeff are in business together. John's got the mandate on the bank account. He's in, accident, in a coma. All of a sudden, um, Jeff can't access the bank because he doesn't have the mandate. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore a business lasting power attorney would allow him to act on John's behalf. Um, or where John dies and um, John's widow then inherits the shares, now maybe have some say in the running of the business. Um, and that also has complications down the line. Um, and again, people are just aren't aware. There's a right way of doing it and there's a wrong way of doing it. If you do it the wrong way, the tax man will take a very big slice. Mm. Mm. So it's, yeah. uh, it is a area of advice, that's for sure. So I guess it is a bit of a minefield out there, isn't it? Yeah, it's fear, I think. Fear of, 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 of the unknown, perhaps, or or just get it wrong, or just, just not lack of knowledge, maybe. Um, yeah. But again, they're not aware they can do these things. Yeah. And I guess the other thing is, is, you know, I guess once the person's dead, they don't care necessarily what happens because, you know, there's not, not a lot of control they have over it once they've uh, got their clogs, as it were. So anyway, no. so, so I ask people on these sessions, you know, what's uh, what's your why? What is it that gets you out of bed in the morning? What sort of like drives you to fight the good fight, as it were? So what would you say drives you? What's what's your fundamental why of why you're in business? Yeah, that's, a, that's always an interesting question, that one, because um, um, it's not that I want to um, make sure everybody in the world has a will, because I'm not that evangelical. Um, it's mainly making sure people have got the right solution, really. Um, again, one of the reasons why I branded Adept Asset Solutions as it is, is, is to not have any sort of will fighter in the, in the commentary, is that uh, what I look to is a, is a step further. Um, and this is around asset protection, uh, which I'll be talking about a bit later. Um, and, and and also, every family I meet has a story. Um, mm. they're fascinating. Um, I was with well, two, two different differing families yesterday, both in the same circumstances. They recently lost someone near and dear, um, and it was it was fascinating um, listening to the sort of um, um, 
in not in fighting, but in commentary within the families about the person who passed and all this sort of thing. You know, they mm-hmm. they, they got over the initial shock of, of losing that person and were reflecting on what they were like and all this sort of sort of thing. Um, and, yeah, amazing. You know, so yeah. Okay. Um... So there's there's obviously other people out there that do um, estate planning, will writing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and um, it's I guess it's an unregulated market in terms of of writing writing wills and stuff. So what what would you, well first of all, I'd be interested to know on your your comment on that um, because I know I know from experience you know a lot of solicitors are sort of like anti non solicitor people writing wills um, uh, for whatever reason. Um, so, I'm, well, let's, let's let's explore that. Well, what what do you think the the, the divide is there? Um, oh, that's, that's one I've not really thought about in terms of preparation for today. Um, I think there's a couple of things really. So, this is a, a regulated by the um, um, regulator, uh, yeah. so on and so forth. Whereas the the non solicitors, um, we have for my me, for example, I'm governed by an organisation called the STEP, the Society of Custody and Estate Practitioners. We have a, a, a self-regulated, so when you use the phrase non-regulated, it's self-regulated as a solicitor. Um, and they lay down certain practices and guidelines and so on. Um, and there's a lot of training involved. So so I've, I'm, I'm at least once a month on at least an hour of CPD, uh, Continual Professional Development, learning about new things or refreshing uh, new things. I'm, I'm a member of SEP myself. Um, and um, there's a lot of, um, not snobbery, but there's a little bit attached to it. Um, I mean, for example, when I first started, um, Five Ponder um, was a big thing that if you didn't have the uh, the TEP exam behind you, you, you shouldn't be touching uh, estate planning. Uh, but then you've got the Society of Will Writers and the Institute of Professional Will Writers who've got their own internal training and qualifications and so on. Whilst they're not valid outside those organisations, they still have validity in what they're doing. Um, and at the end of the day, is a, a, a bad will, unless it's horrendous, is better than no will. Um, and with the proper training, there shouldn't really be too many things that can tie people up post someone's demise. Um, Paul and I, we've talked on many occasions that, that when someone dies, there's a thing called a deed of variation, where, where someone, and might have instructed, uh, um, certain things happen on death, but the beneficiaries don't want that to happen. And mm. within years of someone's death, you can change the direction of that gift. So it could be that rather than receive absolutely, you can receive it under trust, and then it's mm. protected going forward. Um, what, what I do worry about um, are those on the fringes who don't belong to either of these sort of uh, organisations, the, 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 mm. the, the, the free wheelers as such, and they're the ones that, that really do, and I have seen some horror stories where people have, 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 have downloaded a world writing pack and they've tried to cut and paste certain things in, not really understanding what the clauses mean. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and it's a horror story. But mm. they're a minority. Yeah, thank God for that. So, so, uh, so, building on that, then, what would you say from you know from that variety of people out there that could offer? If we just look at the basic will scenario, well, what would you say distinguishes you from your your competitors? Um, I think it's really the the way that I go about things. Um, generally, we all have like a fact finding meeting. Um, we uh, uh, um, will present our our uh, solutions to clients. But the main difference for myself is that um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to um, um, protect those assets from outside influences. So, so for example, there is a, a will structure um, which is, um, creates a life interest trust. It's a technical term. And basically, it means you say your husband and wife, husband dies, it allows the wife to live in that property for her lifetime. And on her death, that trust falls away and that house then belongs to the, the, the generally the children. Um, and the argument behind that is it protects it a bit from care fees, and also if she remarries, part of the house is protected. Mm-hmm. The problem, of course, is that when she dies, that trust, being a, a, a media post-death trust, falls away, it disappears, no longer there. So it means the children could be inheriting 
large assets just when they're going through bankruptcy, going through divorce. Um, they, they themselves may be on their own deathbed. Um, and it's just the wrong time. So whilst that planning was right when they were alive, who knows what the circumstance is going to be when someone dies. So the advice we look at is much more advanced where the trusts don't fall away, they are there for 125 years, um, and they're there to make sure that when people do inherit, they, that, that, that inheritance is going to be, um, therefore, the beneficiaries are not lost to, to, to strangers. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. So at the time of recording this, um, we're just hopefully coming out of a, a, a lockdown or gradually emerging from it. Um, so that has been the biggest challenge for... Uh, most business owners over, over the last year or so. What, what outside of that, with your journey with the debt asset solutions, what would you say is the biggest challenge uh, that, that you've faced over the years? Um, I think biggest challenge. Um, I can't think of a big challenge. Um, I think it's really just the the, uh, the the idea of getting the message across again about how I operate and how different. I believe I am to other sort of solicitors, well writers, and so on. Um, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite laid back individual, so I don't really get sort of too worried about um, if there's competition, because that's great. Um, I'm a big fan of like the, the McDonald's Burger King analogy. Why are they always together? Because you know, not everybody's going to buy from me, so yeah, yeah. they buy something they buy from somebody else. Um, and the, the, in recent times, though, the biggest challenge has obviously been the lack of face-to-face -face networking. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, you and I are, uh, are big endorsers of that, and I love meeting people. We're a social animal by definition. Um, I enjoy people's company. I'm not sure they enjoy mine, but hey, you can't have everything. Um, but um, yeah, and, and, and just having a general laugh, really, and relaxing, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, pardon the pun, we're only here once, make the most of it. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I think we're all looking forward to the day when, you know, the face-to-face -face stuff comes back properly. So um, so has that meant then in terms of how you've done business? Has that had to change? Because obviously there's a lot of signing papers and stuff like that. So have, have you still had to do that and get it physically signed? Or has there been other things that, you know, where electronic signatures are fine? Or how have, how have uh, your business adapted to, to those challenges? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think I think um, it's interesting that I did a little video thing in, in, in about a, a bit of legislation dating back to 1837, which is that um, the um, the witnesses of a will have to be present when mm. the will is signed. Mm. So in the early stages of lockdown, we were at um, numerous sort of venues where the person whose will it would be would be signing. We would be standing outside looking through the window. Um, and passing papers backwards and forwards. Um, and then fortunately, the electronics sort of caught up with itself. And there's a bit of temporary legislation which allows for video uh, um, uh, testation or whatever the expression is, witnessing. Um, but also the, 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 the ability to take instruction via Zoom has also been uh, uh, moved forward. So yeah, a lot of the, in, in in some ways doing by Zoom is a lot easier because it, what we're doing when you're sharing a screen, they, the the client can actually input, see the input on the computer with the actual names and so on. Yeah, so yeah. If spellings they were picked up much earlier. Yeah, no, no, it makes sense. Well, I'm glad that that things have uh, adapted. I guess that's one benefit for, from the current, you know, the last year or so that things have changed, and hopefully they'll still allow that that type of thing. So I think virtual is here to stay. Um, yeah. You, you said earlier you're going to sort of like share a little bit of um, your your knowledge on sort of like protecting uh, assets. So if I just put you in uh, solo screen for a minute. And um, yeah, the floor is yours, Tim, if you just want to learn us. Fantastic. So um, I was talking to Paul earlier about and through probably throughout the whole of this video, uh, asset protection. And asset protection is uh, about estate planning um, and making sure that for generations whatever you own or possess goes down through those generations for forever without being lost through divorce and some other issues which I'll cover in a second. I mean, a good example of this is the Duke of Westminster um, who, who died a, a few years ago. He had a huge estate. I think at the time it was about 10 
billion pounds. Um, his family, way back when, when uh, uh, I think it's probably Waterloo was 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 being fought, created a, a trust, and that trust has allowed those assets to pass and roll down the generations, unaffected from bankruptcies and so on and so forth. And, and the things that happen in life um, that, that that can reduce wealth quite rapidly. Um, so today, that, that 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 trust will roll on for many generations. And again, it's a bit like the um, there's a phrase that goes around that, that wealth is lost on the third generation. A lot of assumptions on that is it down to mismanagement or so on. And normally, unfortunately, it's down to the breakdown of relationships, a divorce and so on. So the way I look at it, there are five main threats to um, um, the wealth. One is marriage after death. Um, and what that simply means is that, uh, say you've got um, Jane and John. John dies. Jane inherits um all of john's wealth um she then meets an attractive young man um and uh they get married and sadly uh that relationship doesn't work out and all of a sudden jane is having to give away half of her estate or her assets to this new fella because he's entitled to do so under divorce laws um and or worse still and this does happen uh, is that Jane actually predeceases the new chap. Uh, they may or may not be in worlds, and all of her assets now his, and whatever children Jane and John had can no longer inherit those assets because they now belong to a different family. Um, and that's quite scary how often that happens, and that's probably one of the biggest concerns to a lot of people. Um, more, more so in some ways than inheritance tax, um, one of the biggest fears I, I talk to people who have created wealth themselves is when their children are growing up and getting into relationships, the last thing they want to do is for their hard-earned money to, to be dissipated because their, their beloved little child has got into a relationship that hasn't worked out. And there are lots of ways of protecting um, assets on that basis. And these are called trusts. Um, and they're discretionary trusts which is a technical, technical term, and basically it allows the uh, trustees to control and possess the property, would it be home savings, business assets, and so on, for the benefit of the beneficiaries, which is an obvious thing. Um, but under law, those beneficiaries don't own those assets. And because of that, they can't be attacked from uh, uh, care fees, from creditors, uh, divorce courts, and so on and so forth. And that's what asset protection is all about, is making sure that those five threats can't dissipate wealth down those generations. Um, another example could be, excuse me, um, where, um, again, Jane and John, perhaps they've got uh, a, a, a little little lad or uh, daughter who are going off in life and they want to buy a property for themselves. Um, and I'm trying to think of a name that was suitable, well, let's call him Tom. So Tom goes off and buys a house, and Jane and John lend him or give him the deposit, let's say £100,000, for his first home, which is, I think, is, seems to be typical these days. Um, and again, Tom, bless him, gets in a relationship, they marry, divorce, suddenly that, that deposit is gone, or half of it's gone to, to, the, to the government or wife, whatever, by, by either lending that, that, that deposit or by gifting it via a trust. Um, because it doesn't legally belong to Tom, whatever happens in his life, it can't be, again, dissipated, it can't be lost. Um, there's uh, situations, again, where people don't realise that if that was something that happened, say, five or six years ago, you're allowed to backdate that protection. Um, um, a good example of that is... Some of you are old enough to remember Margaret Thatcher allowing council house owners to buy um, the council house. Now, by definition, that generally, those people come from lower income, and it could well be that their children have made money, left home, and they, they may have either lent the money to the, uh, the mum and dad to buy the council home, or bought it themselves in their name. Now, the complication with that, of course, is that when mum and dad want to move from that council house, uh, because the circumstances have changed, there's capital gains tax to pay. Um, or 
if it's uh, 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 the money's been lent to uh, to mum and dad, um, they find themselves going to care, and so the, the house is lost to care fees. Again, the protection for that can be backdated right back to day one, rolled back and put into a trust arrangement, um, whereby the, the mum and dad are beneficiaries of that trust. The son or daughter are the, are the trustees and the settler of that trust, the person who created the trust. Um, and because it, it, they are they're living in a, a family home and they are beneficiaries of that trust, it benefits from private property relief, and which means there's no capital gains tax on the disposal. Um, and also, there's no inheritance tax should the council tax home sort of go up in value. I used to live in a council tax home, it's called the Barbican, and they are massively valuable um, and that sort of planning can be done to protect uh, that sort of thing. Um, other things that we talk about generally for those who are um, much older in life, um, probably um, in or approaching retirement, is the aspect that um, the family home could be uh, again assessed for care fees um, and there's sort of a disparity at the moment in that you could have someone in the same care home who saved all their life um, and they're having to pay their own care fees where someone who has not been able to save all their life is funded by the local authority uh, but they're getting the same care um, so because of the unequalization of that people think that's a bit unfair so we can protect the family home either from uh, or at the point of death from from care fees for the survivor or indeed for both of them in their lifetime uh, um, um, from care fees. The common situation I come across is where a husband and wife, one of them sadly is in care, and they own the home jointly, which is again quite common, um, and um, the, the, the person who's not in care is concerned if they were to die, by definition the house will then pass to that spouse who is uh, uh, um, in care and, that, and now the family home is accessible for care fees and could be lost. It only takes a couple of years of being in care and the, and the fees can ramp up quite rapidly. And one of the things we talk about to clients is well what you can do is separate the ownership of that family home on a 50-50 basis uh, by what's called a non-mutual de uh, uh, deed and uh, basically means that the, um, the land registry recognise the person in care owns half the house, the person not in care owns the other half, and on their death, the person who's not in care will pass through their will, through trusts, and therefore can't be assessed for care for these. Obviously, the, 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 the other half will be accessible and may be lost. Um, surprisingly, it's only 23,500 the amount of savings you need before you start self-funding care and if you've got care fees ranging at a thousand pounds a week which in my area is quite common or usual um, you can see it's not going to be long before sort of care fees sort of disappear and that's that's the real thing that i get involved in in terms of more than wills because wills themselves are, 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 are will on its own as i said is about as useful as a chocolate teapot um, it, will, it will describe where assets you go to but there's no longer-term protection for the wealth. And if you've worked hard and you've built up savings, the last thing you want to do is lose them to either tax man, tax man or in-laws or complete strangers. Um, and that's really what uh, my business is about. Okay, excellent. So it sounds like, you know, that people really do need to think about the, the future with any assets that they've got, be it personal or business. Um, and just get some advice from somebody like you to understand what the options are. Um, um, and, you know, I, I've, I've obviously used your service and found it quite invaluable. And with recent situations in my life, you know, it's coming into its own now in order to, you know, to, to better manage uh, the, the assets without, you know, the liabilities that normally go with them had I had I not put stuff in trust. So, yes, yeah, so it's definitely worth uh, uh, having a chat, just learning more about you know what, what's possible so you know i was ignorant i fell into the ignorant catch guard no idea um and it was just through you know you talking about these things at networking that i decided to explore it more so yeah absolutely there's options out there aren't there there's options out there yeah. that people need to explore yeah, i think the thing that caught your eyes my my favorite phrase which is that um, 
uh, capital gains tax is, 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 is accidental. Inheritance tax is avoidable and residential care fees can, you know, can be uh, mitigated, you know, completely yeah. planned for. Yeah, planned for. Um, and yeah, your case is, is, is an interesting one, which I'd love to share, but I'm not going to because there's obviously privacy calls about that. Um, but yes, it's, uh, yours was, was a great uh, example of what I could do. Mm. Yeah. No, thank you. So one final thing then, if you were just to give one top tip for any small business owner out there, it doesn't necessarily have to be from, you know, based on what you do, it might be from your base uh, as a small business owner. What would that, what would that top tip be? Well, uh, get a business coach. Yeah, okay. definitely. Sorry, sorry to plug what you do, Paul, but yeah, get a business coach. Get a mentor or someone you can share what you're thinking in your business. Um, mm -hmm. It could be it could be your best mate down the pub, or it could be someone who's qualified and recognised um, as a business coach. There are plenty, certainly in in, in Buzzcom, um, because if you're going to uh, uh, take your business where you want it to, you need some sense checking at times, and also um, what's that phrase where um, not ownership, but um, um, where you say you're going to do something and don't do it. And Accountability. Accountability. Thank you. Accountability. Um, and it's very easy to um, to sort of uh, lie to oneself about that. Uh, yeah. And I think um, if any if any any simple thing would be anybody starting out or established, if you haven't done so, get a business coach. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, the, there are paid for services like mine or other people, but you know, through networking, you'll meet people that are probably more than happy, you know, just to spend an hour with you a month or something like that, or over the phone, whatever it might be, you know, just for that that uh, sh shoulder to cry or ear to bend, whatever you need at the time. Um, but yeah, yeah, because sometimes, you know, the old adage, you can't see the wood for the trees. Sometimes yeah. you don't. And, uh, you know, I've when I've used people like that and just as a sounding board, you know, that they'll say something that's obvious to them that has never been obvious to me until they've said it. So, so it's definitely worth having an external influence, whatever that looks like. No, good tip. So um, your ordeal is over, Tim. So thank you for your time today. Um, I'm going to end the broadcast there and let you crack on with the rest of your week. Thank you very much. Thank you.